how do you tell the story of a people who've never really written or chronicled their story? And what's more, have been vilified by those who did write their story. Well, that's the, the problem that uh, British journalist and author Anthony Sutton tries to correct uh, and address through his book, Nomads, The Wanderers Who Shaped Our World. Uh, Anthony joins us from London uh, uh, to discuss his book. It is a fascinating uh, book. In fact, it's much smaller than it can be because it covers such a huge stretch of history and geography. Anthony, such a pleasure to have you with us on our book club. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. A pleasure to be here. Anthony, I mean, I must start by saying that, as I was telling you, uh, you know, when we were doing our briefing call, this book could have been three books because, you know, you've covered such a, a, a vast uh, stretch of history and, and geography in it. But I want to start by asking you how you forayed into the subject. It is a difficult subject to tackle simply because, as I said, it's a story of a people who've never really put down their story. So what made you venture into this? Because your, your last couple of books have been more towards the fiction side. That's right. Well, I think, um, I start, well, I started out writing fiction. That was my intention. I was going to be a novelist. And I was a novelist to begin with. Um, and then I got involved in um, writing not narrative nonfiction. So my, actually my, my, last, my last book was a biography of, of Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and my book before that was, which I talked about quite a bit in India, actually, in, for instance, at the Chaipur Literature Festival, was uh, about Florence Nightingale and Gustave Flaubert on the Nile together. And I had thought about writing that as a as a novel, but um, the, 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 their own material was so good, I thought it, that there's a sort of strength in, in sticking with their own words and writing it as a nonfiction. And so since then, I've been writing nonfiction, although I might go back to writing a novel next, who knows. But with this, I've been, I've been living in and traveling around the Middle East uh, much, of, much of my adult life. And I've really, you know, the Arab and nomadic culture is, has become part of, you know, part of me. It's part of my DNA now. I speak Arabic and I, I've, I feel very comfortable in, in North Africa and the Middle East. But, uh, and one of the things that becomes clear is that, you know, their whole background is nomadic. Um, and yet here I am, I've come out of England and my, my training is, is both storytelling, but also uh, in history is European history. And we don't have nomads, well, if we do have nomads, you know, there are three nomads who we, who we can name check. There's Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan and, and Tamerlane. And they are presented as the sort of the world's great destroyers. And, and it's true that they did do some destruction, but, um, but I, but that's clearly not the story. And also, I spent um, I've been lucky enough to spend about twenty five years um, being paid to go traveling around the world by various magazines, and um, and I I became known as the person who would go to places you know that were that were more difficult, and they would inev inevitably be places that were nomadic. Um, so you know, I went on a camel camel in in the Tar Desert. I went as soon as um, Myanmar opened their Andaman Islands. I went went there. And there you have nomads who live on boats, um, the, the Mokon, and I, so I went to write about them. And it, I, it, the more I built up this portfolio of, of experiences that I'd had, the more it became obvious that, that there was something wrong with our history books, or at least the ones that I'd read. And also sitting behind this is a man called Bruce Chatwin, who, um, who English writer, who um, wrote fiction and nonfiction and was obsessed with nomads. And he wrote a book about Aborigines, but his first book, which was never published, is sort of rather in the spirit of what I've done. It was called The Nomadic Alternative. Um, and, uh, and, and it is an attempt to try and put nomads in the picture. We live in a time of extraordinary um, repositioning of history, retelling of history. Um, and so it seemed like a very good time to do it. And also, so, I mean, I started this about seven years ago. And, and then early in, in my research, uh, this ridiculous thing happened in my own country, uh, in, in England, that we had the Brexit vote, which we were all confident we were going to win, and then we lost. Um, and, and I wanted to write something that would be, um, you know, a celebration of the what happens with open borders, open minds, when people are free to, to move and to talk and to share experiences. And so in a way, this is also a celebration of that. And, and I hope one of the things that comes out of it 
is that uh, there's some of the best moments and the most creative moments and the, the flourishings of the world have come about through people moving and being free to move and encouraged to move um, and open, bo open borders. I, open I have a lot of uh, questions for you, uh, Anthony, and I, I, I'm <laughs> sure our viewers will too, because you know, I'll tell you what I found interesting about this and why um, on the book, book club we are expanding the horizon of uh, our history and our understanding of history, because I really believe that a, what a book like yours does is really underline the interconnectedness, the collective histories, the fact that it's all about connecting the dots. We can't look at modern geographical boundaries to try and understand the story of, of our own people. It is about interconnectedness. The second thing, and I love the quotes, and I'm going to use that because uh, you know it, it, I think frames the question really well. So you, you've taken two quotes on the, in, the interconnectedness between history and geography. The first, mm -hmm. you have quoted somebody saying, nomads have no history, only a geography. And that was the old way of looking at it. But you go on to refine that by quoting another um, scholar who, who said that uh, history is geography in motion. There is, um, yeah, a large part of the book, it, it, revolves around Eurasia, although in the in the in the last third, I do write about um, Australia and and North and, and a little bit of South America as well. Um, but there is this amazing step, but a sort of corridor between Hungary and therefore Eastern Europe and uh, and China. Um, and if you look on the left, <laughs> You have, uh, sort of just under the title, you have um, the Great Hungarian Plain and the, where the Huns came from. Um, and if you saddled up and on your, on your horse and started riding east, just when the spring flowers first come out in the Hungarian Plain, it would be possible to get the whole way across that step, Pontic Caspian step, and then through um, through Af well, across Afghanistan, across uh, Kazakhstan. There's a little bit of a barrier right in the middle where the, where the coast is now the Altai Mountains. Um, th but they are passable um, and you can ride through them, particularly in, in the summer. And, th and then you're across the Mongolian Plateau and then you're down into, into China. And you'll see um, and under the Mongolian plateau, there's there's this, this name Shongnu, and below that is sort of dotted line. Well, that's where the Chinese built the Great Wall, and the Great Wall was built to stop people who were moving across the steppes from coming into 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 Chinese territory. Obviously, it failed. All barriers have. Failed. I mean, the Romans tried to do a similar thing on the on on the, the uh, western side of this Great Steppe corridor, and so across here you have a, a, a landscape that is not good for, for agriculture, but is brilliant for herding. Um, and uh, that it may well be somewhere up here is where Indo-Europeans spring from. Um, there's, but it's very, the winters are very, very harsh. The summers are very, very hot, um, but it provides great grazing for, for, um, for herds, as I said. And so, it, it was not suited, and you can see, you know, the, in in that landscape, there's n there are not a lot of big cities. It's very good for people moving around. Um, there's seasonal water. There are some rivers that come down through it, but it generally it's somewhere that you want to pass through at the right time of year and then move on. And so out of that came these extraordinary coalitions of people. And um, this particular map, I mean, I, I remember being taught his, the history of the Roman Empire, which, you know, it's, which stops um, just beyond well, where it says Pontic Caspian Steppe, that's the end of the Roman Empire. And on, on the other side, by the Great Wall, you have the Chinese, the, the, the Han Empire. And between the two, these, you know, these were the poles of, poles of civilization in the sort of from second century BC to second, third century AD, you have this huge area. And it, what it appears is that there was a coalition, an alliance of nomadic peoples. In the, in the West, they're called Scythians. In the East, they're called the Xiongnu. We actually have no idea what they call themselves. They left no records, I mean, no written records, or very, very few. Um, we know that the Xiongnu did not call themselves Xiongnu because I think that means something like ch the, the children of slaves. And they certainly wouldn't have called themselves that because they were very proud and powerful people. 
And um, this, the Greeks and the, and the Romans write about Scythians, the Chinese write about the Xiongnu, but we don't have anything directly from the Scythians or from the Xiongnu. But it appears from burials in the east and the west of this huge, huge area, um, similar style burials, which are huge mounds, um, maybe up to 50 or, or more meters around. Um, and with sometimes with 10, 20, 30 human burials inside and lots and lots of horses that was clearly sacrificed and buried in there with them. But whether in the east or the west of this huge corridor, you find the same sort of things. You find Chinese silk, you find um, gold jewelry from the, yeah, for instance, here's a, yes, here is a, um, a, a Kurgan or a, a burial mound. And you, so whether in the east or the west of this vast terrain, you find the same sort of grave goods. Um, from from Europe and as far as far east as from China, you find silks, you find um, Persian Persian rugs, you find all sorts of extraordinary and beautiful things. And so clearly, if these people were not uh, allied politically, they were certainly trading with each other. It was a linked up world, and yet. They're not in our history books. We know nothing about them. The British Museum had a big exhibition on the Scythians five years ago. And I don't know anybody who went to it who had heard of them before, the, before that day. They're just not, they're just not part, part of our currency. And yet they say, so shoot. And it's amazing because you, know, you speak and you bring to light the story, and I didn't know about it, of a Scythian queen who killed Cyrus the Great of Persia. But I'm gonna to come to that. I, I'm curious to you know, go back a little no, uh, and uh, very briefly, because there's such a lot to cover, I'm going to you yeah. know, just intersperse it with questions. The first is, you know, you talk about the agricultural revolution and the conflict between the nomads and the settlers. And that is something that goes back deep in time. You're talking about the 12,000, 10,000 BCE. And you, you trace it to the myths that all religious texts and epics have, you know, of this conflict and the Cain and Abel story keeps coming back, uh, you know, very, very quickly, uh, Anthony, because I, I want to get to the, the very controversial and interesting period of the, of the, the 2000 uh, BCE, you know, with the, with, of the Bronze Age. Yes. So uh, a quick uh, look at this myth making, this, this, the hint of what could have happened. Yes, well, we, I mean, we, we, the, the advances in, in archaeology in the last 10, 20 years, and particularly this period sort of, you know, from 5000 BC back, 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 is it had been wonderful. And one of the things that has occurred is a place called Gobekli Tepe in, in Turkey, which is dated from 9500 BC. And, it, and that has that identification was made about eight years ago, and nobody's disputed it. And what you have is, are T-shaped pillars. Mm -hmm. um, cut from limestone, um, straight pillars, uh, mounted, they're put in circles, a, a 12 in a circle, with, and they're about 10, 12 feet high, and there are, there are higher ones in the middle, two taller ones in the middle, and there are these circles all over a hillside at a place called Gobekli Tepe, and they're carved, uh, they're incised with um, images of humans and animals, and this is, this is, 7,000 years before the pyramids. This is, you know, this, the, the, the gap here is extraordinary. We have no idea how they cut. They, you know, the tools they had were flints, how they smoothed them, how they moved them. They moved them about 500, to, to 500 feet to maybe half a mile. We don't know, something like that. Um, I mean, not huge, but still they're massive pillars. Um, and then they they buried them eventually. I mean, the site was used for about a thousand years, and then and then one day they abandoned it. But the people who built this were nomads, were hunter gatherers. Um, they didn't live there initially. It was a place to come for a, a sacred moment, and then to go away again. But as the cult grew, um, the, they needed some people who would um, who would be there permanently, and they hunted and gathered everything that they could in the area. And it appears that this is the place where wheat was first domesticated. I mean, the first strain of domesticated wheat has been found about twenty five miles from this place. So it's quite you know this is here we go. This is this is Gobekli Tepe. It's quite possible that that this is why humans domesticated wheat. So they they needed to. to to maintain this cult and it, again we have no idea why they built it here we have no idea who they were more than i mean and, and it's still a an excavation site i mean there are lots and lots and lots of these circles that they haven't dug up yet 
Um, so there's, they're finding new things all the time. Um, and they found other things nearby as well. The same from the same period, about 15 miles away, they found the the um, the oldest uh, life size sculpture of a human, uh, who's now called Urfa Man because he's in the museum at a place called Urfa. Um, again, cut out of limestone, six feet high. These are extraordinary things. But they came about through through um, from mobile people. And what, one of the things I love about this is, is we um, in the West have valued people according to the monuments they've been able to build. And we've considered it part uh, as you know, a sign of a settled culture. Um, and, and nomads therefore, who have tended not to build things, have tended not to be in our history. But here at the very beginning of our history now, recorded history, we have, we have, we have hunter-gatherers, we have mobile people. And so that's, the, that's how I opened this book. I mean, I think it's a very, very exciting start. And out of that comes so much. But coming back to your idea of the myth, I mean, we, ha we have the idea of the Garden of Eden or some, you know, some sacred moment, a sacred time in, in our past, which we can't recover physically. But it's clearly referring to a time when we were hunter-gatherers. We lived in a garden where we had everything we needed to eat and where there was a time of ease. And something went wrong. And out of that comes a d division in humans between the hunt, the people who go, who go herding and moving, and those who settle between Cain and Abel, and and that's a story that plays out throughout my book because, obviously, we have we have periods where um, where the the settled are, are dominant and periods where the nomads are dominant. I mean, for instance, with the Mongols. Yeah. You know, uh, while when we look at history, the agricultural revolution is seen as a major milestone. Uh, in, the, in the story of human civilization, you point out to another factor that doesn't get as much attention. And that is really the moment when man decided that he could ride a horse. And that seems to have happened, of course, in that uh, belt of the steps. Uh, and that has a, a pretty transformative uh, uh, power. Because uh, I'm going to put the spotlight in on that period of 2000 BCE. You know, we do know that there was a climatic um, uh, environmental uh, disaster, climate change, some kind of an event that forced migrations. Uh, and I would like yeah. you to put the spotlight on that because you have drawn parallels between what happened all the way from the Mycenaeans uh, to the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, Persians, and of course, the Indus Valley. Yes, I think I, clearly there is um, something, something, uh, a weather cycle changes. Um, and m there was obviously a warming as, as rather like a warming we're going through now. I mean, I think climate change is not new. It, if it, humans have just sped it up by, by our actions for the last hundred years. But so there were throughout history, there were there were moments of cooling and of, of heating. And, and maybe, for instance, why, why somewhere like Gobekli Tepe was abandoned because there may have been a warming. And so, but if you're a herder and you live on the, that huge belt of steppe land that goes from, from Europe to China um, and, you're, and you're going through a warming, um, you will have gone through a period of, of plenty where, you, where your herds would be big and your, and your tribes would be big as well. And then, and then suddenly you're, you're running out of water and you're running out of pasture. Well, you start pushing around and you push the people next to you off their bit and they push the people next to them off their bit and you have this knock-on effect and you have people coming off into China, into Europe and down into the Middle East and down, in, down the Indus Valley into into Pakistan and India. And that's clearly what, what happened in um, it, with the, the Indus Valley civilizations. And um, there, there may have been a warming already. We, we don't know what happened for instance, into the cities like Mohenjo-Daro and, and um, the others along the Indus Valley, but uh, because they may have been overwhelmed by by this influx of people, but they may have already been abandoned. I mean, we can't we can't tell. But I, my theory is that you have these people who've come down with more sophisticated uh, weapons. They've created. Well, they've firstly learned how to ride a horse, and secondly, they've built chariots. And thirdly, they've created the composite bow, which is um, as the Egyptians found out to their cost, is a lot more efficient. It's a sort. It's a bow that's made out of several pieces of wood much, much longer and has much greater accuracy and much greater range than a, a, a bow made out of a single piece of wood. Um, and it allowed, for instance, the Hyksos who invaded 
Egypt around this time to overwhelm the, the pharaohs um, only for a hundred years because that's how long it took the pharaohs to master the new technology and then push back. But what you see in, in um, along the Indus Valley is these people, and I don't know if it was a, it, it has been described as an invasion and I'm not sure it is an invasion. I think in, instead it's a sort of, you know, maybe you get a family or a tribe or a part of a tribe coming down with their herds and then, but it goes on year after year until suddenly you realize that there's an awful lot of, of other people in your territory. Mm. Um, you know, this and, is a, a very politically loaded issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. There's such a lot of controversy around it, but you know what, most people uh, fail to, uh, to understand is that pretty much everybody has spoken it, of it as spurts of migration and not uh, uh, exodus of people into the valley. So that's one of the uh, clarifications. And the second is we don't, uh, you know, I don't think we look at what was happening in the rest of the world uh, enough when we talk about this area. You know, I visited Sinoli and I remember us talking about it and you've mentioned yes. Sinoli, which is this necropolis uh, of um, what looked like a warrior community with very advanced weaponry, women using and wielding swords, and there is a proto chariot. And I want to pull out uh, the visuals that we took at uh, Sonali. Um, yeah. They're quite spectacular. How do you uh, assess this, especially uh, on the basis of what you have found elsewhere around this period, Anthony? Because you've kind of collated a lot of the information across geography, so it'd be interesting to understand that. That's right. I mean, well, this, this discovery was made while I was working on the book. Um, you know, it it this sort of this sort of archaeology is is happening now, and so to it's it's quite difficult to make any comprehensive judgment on what's happening. But clearly, this is a chariot burial of people who uh, who will have come from from elsewhere. You can tell from their weapons and from the and from the style of burial because this is not a traditional um, burial for this area. And so what it seems, but you do find these burials, for instance, over on the Pontic Caspian steppe above the Caspian Sea and over towards Hungary. Um, and you do find them uh, elsewhere as well. And it looks like these are people who have come down off the steps, who have been not lived in the area for long enough to have been, um, uh, to, for, for them to have become you know, become nativized to, for them to have changed their old ways. So they've been buried in the in the in the according to the rituals of the place where they came from, rather than the rituals of the place that they've come to. Probably, if they'd been there another generation, another generation, on, you won't find this sort of burial anymore. It'll be it'll be how you know because people that's this is not how people in Sonoli were burying themselves at that period. So these are these are clearly foreigners and. Um, and they're, they're being buried with their weapons and with their chariots because this was what was most important to them. Um, this is a, what this I is find a... interesting in the, is the parallels that you've drawn with the uh, similar necropolis or, or burial grounds in the Caspian Pontic steppes, which is really, uh, you know, uh, towards Hungary. And, you know, that shows That's that right. there is a similarity in that. And, you know, I think uh, we what we really need is archaeologists from different parts of the world to come together to collate information and, and look at parallels. Uh, the, the problem with the, there is a problem with archaeology, though in, well, it's not a problem, but it's just that the knowledge is so immense of any one place at any one time that to to get someone to who can understand everything that's happening in the world at that particular that moment is it's difficult. Absolutely difficult, but and, and more and more work needs to be done in that context of yes. Of point efforts. How can you understand any place in isolation, really? In yes. Your, yeah, exactly. But clearly, when I read when I when I read about this discovery, it seemed to me that this was an you know this is an an Indo-European um, who's come come down off the off the steps and who well, Indo-European people who've come off the steps and have have been buried there in their tradition in their their traditional way rather than the local tradition. And yet, it was being claimed um, by some that it that you know it shows that we in India had you know had these weapons. Well, I'm not sure. At yeah, that particular the, moment, you know, a generation on it might have been completely yeah, different. We might not know because there's been a, a prolific finds of of these copper hoards, so to say, the copper culture that that we have. But you know, uh, that's the other thing that you kind of, and of course, you know, what just an aside for 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 those attending. What I find fascinating is that all Bronze Age civilizations have a sharp deurbanization phase where the whole memory of the great cities of the great civilization is wiped out, and there is a renewal in India. 
the access moves from the Indus Basin to the Yamuna and the Gangetic Basin. And that is really fascinating because you see that in Greece, you see that in Egypt and elsewhere. But let's move to another uh, myth that you've tried to bust. And you spoke about the Corbids, uh, the, which are the, the mounds. And uh, we know the finery that has been found in some of these, the gold finery in the Scythian uh, tombs, the mounds. And one another myth is that uh, most of these nomads were barbaric. They didn't have a taste for the fine things. They were simple. They were crude. Uh, mm. And that's something that you kind of bust also during the course of this book. Well, yes. I mean, I think clearly uh, the people who are calling them barbarians are people who may not have may may not have seen them at all. Um, I mentioned, for instance, that that they were known in. I mean, were the the Scythians um, were were part of the Greek. Greek army. I mean, you had Scythian archers in Athens. Um, they were part of the civil defense, and um, and they were certainly known to the Romans. But but they were an easy target because they're the people from elsewhere. They're the, they're the foreigners. They're the migrants. They're the um, and so they're they're always being run down. There's a lovely story in in Sumer. So going back, you know, a couple of thousand years before this. Um, who, where uh, there's a story of a princess who wants to marry a nomad and she's being told, you know, he, you can't do that. He, he doesn't live in one particular place. He, you know, he wears leather. He, um, he doesn't know the, the rituals. He is not known. And I think this idea of not being known as in he doesn't come from this one particular place um, as a reason why she shouldn't marry. Um, and this sense of, uh, you know, that nomads have always been very easy to attack because they they are not known, you know, by, by the settled people. But even that is a fallacy because for most of human history, um, settled communities have been absolutely dependent on nomads and vice versa. And particularly, for instance, in, in Sumer, we know there's lots of literature from ancient Sumer um, this is Iraq, where um, where you have farmers who are reliant on the on the nomads coming with their herds to eat the stubble after harvest and to fertilize the fields with the animals droppings and then to go away. So there's always the anxiety: will they come, and will they stay too long? And you know, and will they push off so we can so we can um, sow sow the next the next crop? And but there was this dependence, and and the same for nomads as well. A lot of their product um cheese and you know whatever else need and needed to be it was it's time sensitive they needed to be able to sell it they needed markets they needed open borders and so for most of human history there has been a very happy in, in interdependence between these two groups and you tend to find when you get someone you know like I me mean, for instance attila the hun coming forward and and attacking the romans it's because the romans have wanted to close the markets or the or the river crossings mm -hmm. to to these people who need to get across i mean it's an existential threat to them to have the markets closed so and so they attack right i'm going to take one uh, of the viewer queries um, uh, because it's an interesting question on gender what was the gender composition of the populations of, of nomads that migrated to different areas of the world there's a question by rajita shukla and rajita i must tell you that in the necropolis there are uh, burials of women with a dagger indicating that that might have been uh, uh, their dagger and hence women could have been warriors and there is this lovely reference to the Scythian queen so i'm going to uh, hand this over to you yes. as we talk, talk about gender and among the nomads we what we know and again it i mean it's partly from, put together from what has been found in in things like burials as you mentioned and partly from um texts that have come from from outsiders and the occasional for instance from the from the mongols we know uh, there there is a, a written mongol history that has survived i mean it's patchy but bits of it have survived and from the mughals from from babel for instance in from, in, in his own account um, that that there are there is absolute reverence and dependence on women, We're, and um, we know, for instance, with uh, with Genghis Khan and with with Timur that there, but particularly Genghis Khan, his his relationship with his wife is very well recorded. That, that, that they they're absolute equals. She rules the empire just as much as he does. He goes off and does the fighting, but at all the councils that have been recorded, um, you know where where the it's been decided where they're going to ex try and expand into and and his wife is always there sitting beside him 
and has the same status. And going back further, as you say, with these, um, with the burials, with the, there are high status women being buried with significant wealth and in, and in grand style and dressed in, a, you know, in beautiful robes and the sort of robes that from that period, which, because it's again, there's a Roman, uh, the Roman Empire period, we, you would find a Roman empress being buried with that with, you know, and surrounded by gold jewelry, gold bowls with bronze tripods, all sorts of all so sorts of treasures. Um, but you mentioned the Scythian queen Tomiris, and it's too good a story to pass over. And, um, and this, you know, this is in uh, Herodotus, and so it, you know, it, it, it's it's recorded in the in the text, and it appears to, it 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 appear, it has the ring of, of of truth about it. And so there is a Scythian queen, there isn't a Scythian king, and again, we don't know who the Scythians were, we don't know what they called themselves. We assume that there's a large alliance of no, of nomad tribes. Um, and they were being threatened by the Persians, who and Cyrus the Great. This is in the 600s, 500s BC. Um, Cyrus the Great had built the Persian Empire um, and was was now pushing further on, and he wanted to push into into Scythia, and the Scythians re resisted and said, "Stay back! You know, you say your side of the river will stay out. You will stay ours, and we're looking at you know beginning." To, Getting into Central Asia, um, Kazakhstan at this point, and and the the Persians persisted, and it comes to a fight, and um, the Scythian queen was rather angry also because uh, Cyrus had captured her son, and who had then committed suicide rather than sort of face the ignominy of being taken captive, and so she wanted to avenge him, and she said she said to Cyrus sent to messengers saying you know you've only come for blood you know why don't you just go home we don't have to do this and and Cyrus persists and there's a battle and he is killed, and there's a, a story goes that she had told him that she would sate his his thirst for blood and so what when his body is brought the head is cut off and it's put into a bag full of of human blood. And she says, there you go, that's, that's enough blood for you. And it, it's a story that echoes, I mean, not necessarily the killing, but this, this aversion to a pitched battle. Because jump forward not so many years and you have Darius the Great, the Persian em emperor, who again goes into, into Scythia and the Scythians tell him not to. Um, but rather than stand and fight, they, the Scythians, and at this point they have a king rather than the queen, they just keep moving back and back and back. And the, Darius, I think, has 500 or 700,000 troops. His supply lines are getting very stretched. Um, and eventually he sends a very fast messenger to go and catch, catch up with the Scythian king and say, why won't you fight? Either fight or give me the tribute as your, as, as your, your sovereign. And the, the Scythian king says, why would we fight? We have no fields that you could burn. We have no cities that you could trash. And we don't need to fight you. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they just keep on moving away and, and Darius gives up and goes home. But he goes home and writes the story that he defeated the Scythians, which is not true. Mm -hmm. You know, what also stands out is the ripple effect that we speak about. And uh, we see that constantly throughout history. And periodically, after every thousand, 700 to 1,000 years, you have something that happens along this corridor, and there's a ripple effect that we feel across. Uh, I'm talking about the Huns, uh, the, the Scythians. You have the Kushanas coming into India. You have this whole, yes. and then you have the Huns. And again, around Atla, the Hun, you have Mirakula who comes into India. So there is this constant push that happens. And what I did realize what it was it was Attila the Huns pushing that sent the Goths into uh, the uh, to to uh, try and cross over into the Roman Empire as well. So this is a fascinating body of of you know work that you have put together simply because you've connected the dots. Anthony. Yes, but also I, uh, remember the reason for this. I, it was I mean Attila the Hun is not interested necessarily in conquest, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and the Romans are puzzled by this because. He doesn't live in any of the cities he captures, for instance. He continues to live in, in, in tents. Um, and they, they, they simply don't understand. But what he wants is freedom of movement. He wants open borders and open markets. And he keeps on saying to the Romans, this is what I need from you. And they keep on 
well, there's there's lots and lots of toing and froing of of, of ambassadors, um, but they keep on reneging on the agreement until in the end, of course, the the empire is destroyed by by the Huns and the Goths and and the Vandals and the others who who come in needing to trade, um, and obviously uh, th this this is a great interest to me because you know but this book was written during the Brexit period. <laughs> Um, something that I oppose very strongly, and and it's it's quite clear whatever period you look at in history that the the glory moments come about through freedom of movement of people and goods and ideas and a freedom of conscience and the bad moments are ones where people try to put up borders, and um, it was a previous American president who said if you don't have borders you don't have a country, well to a point, but you need to have your borders open. Mm. Is my right. point right? I'm going to take some related questions because it's a good way of uh, kind of also bringing in the audience questions. Uh, Amit Mukherjee has a question: Was the stirrup which revolutionized horse riding and warfare invented by the nomad horse riders of the period? Is there any way of knowing? Uh, there's some really convincing, um, very convincing archaeology that's been done on it. Yes. And I think you can say, well, it certainly came off the Pontic Caspian steppe, and it appears to have been um, mobile um, herders who, who came about with this. I mean, again, we don't, I mean, the, as with the um, the taming of the, the domestication of horses was one thing, but riding them is another. Um, who had the idea of writing it? But it was this. This would seem to me was an, an extraordinary. That really was a revolution because it happened just like that one day. Someone decided they were going to get up, and they didn't. They didn't get pushed off. Um, and you know, it's not something that's sort of incremental. Suddenly, humans know how to ride a horse, and they do it from thousands BC up until you know it was the, the main mode of transport until a hundred years ago. I think the New York Fire Department only got rid of their horse-drawn fire trucks a hundred years ago. So you know, it's you know, it, it, an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. But I think stirrups, yes, and you, yes, this, this is a wonderful one thing. It's called the Paziric carpet, and it's it's come out of a, a burial, one of those kurgans, one of those big mounds, and um, and which period would this be, uh, This is this is Kazakhstan. So which from, which period? I think this is about about the four thousand fourth millennium BC. Oh wow! It is it is considered the oldest carpet in the world, and it's a, a beautiful beautiful thing. And um and it's I think it's in in Moscow now or St Petersburg, but uh yeah you can see horsemen all around, and there's also an image of a seated person, which seems mm -hmm. to be detached somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the mobile world. I mean. The stirrup was and the and the bridle um both came out of the Pontic Caspian steppe. So that's the the area just north of the steps just north of the Caspian Sea. That's fantastic. A fourth third century BC uh, carpet, Pazuric carpet, which is in Russia, as uh, Anthony has pointed out. Anthony, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is interesting also is of course the fact that many of these nomads, I mean, while we call them nomads, they did um seed some of the greatest empires of the world and you yes. know starts uh, and and you have this uh, middle section which is really about the imperial age the age of the imperial act as you call it and you pick it up from the rise of arabia to the end of the mongol period and then you know you you take it forward and we'll come to that but what do you think was the key the, for the rise of the arabs for instance and arabs by the way are the people of the sand, of the people of the desert. And that's how you, the, the word yes. Arab comes, which is very interesting. But what made it click? What worked for them? Um, it, well, I, I, I write quite a lot about the um, 14th century philosopher, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun, who, um, who if, as I say, if you haven't, if you don't know the name, you certainly felt his, you, you've heard some of his ideas because they play out, for instance, in, in sociology, but also in economics today, um, about taxation, about, uh, about lots of things. But he writes about um, nomad empires and about how the Arabs, but also the Mongols and, and the Persians come out of this huge energy 
that um, and and he def he defines people as being in different states of innocence and development, and he talks about um, how city people are the most corrupt, and the weakest, and how um, people who live in the desert uh, and particularly camel herders in in for the Arabs um, are the hardest and the, and the closest to the original state to the state of innocence, and he he devises a because he looks at what happened and nobody had done this before. Um, he looks at the rise and fall of these empires and and he considers it takes about three or four generations between the coming together of these people behind a leader who has um, charisma, but also and he, he calls this an asabia, a gathering a coming together of people who have uh, but behind a leader who has a, an idea or a project or, or but who can hold hold different people together with this idea. In this case, with the Arabs, it's the Prophet Muhammad with the idea of Islam. And, um, and, and then the next generation um, fulfill the vision and the next generation, but eventually you, you come to a time where um, the grandchildren or the great grandchildren or the fifth generation have become so softened by, this, by the, the trappings of success that they are then overwhelmed and the empire is refreshed by new people who come out of, uh, by, by nomads, other nomads. And, and so Ibn Khaldun draws a line, which I then follow the whole way from, from the Arabs to, um, to Timur, Tamerlane, who he actually meets in, in, in Damascus. Um, but he, so yeah, this rise of, of the Arabs is, is extraordinary. And, you know, and, and, you know, if you, they go well, well to the left of the map here <laughs> um mm -hmm. you know to conquer the whole the whole of north africa and into up into spain and portugal and and very far into the east as well and it, it happens so quickly but partly it happens because the you know the great powers at that time were um the persians and you can see um in the middle of the map samar and baghdad and the romans in the romans in constantinople and in rome and there'd been this, particularly at this time in Constantinople, the Eastern Empire, because the Western Empire was more or less exhausted. But um, they had been the the Romans from Constantinople and the the um, Persians had been fighting this sort of hundred year battle or whatever. They were exhausted, and along came this you know these these people out of the desert who nobody had ever heard of before. And um, and there's a there's a great moment where because the, the Prophet Muhammad. This is this is most likely a legend. Sent a letter both to the Persian emperor and to the to the um, Roman emperor to say, join you know embrace Islam and you know and all will be well. And if you don't, then your empire will fall. And um, obviously they will. If this such a message message was received, you would have thought, who, <laughs> who are these guys and where 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 is Arabia? You know, nobody had ever heard of it. And and yet, you know. Very soon after that, there's um, one of Muhammad's messengers had been um, had been killed by a Byzantine commander, and so Muhammad sent a force, uh, and they meet um, somewhere, well, to to the east of Jerusalem, and um, it probably in, in what's now yeah in, in Jordan somewhere around there, and and there's this sort of there's this great battle, but what the the Arabs thought they were just going to go and um, and punish this local commander, but it turns out there's the whole Byzantine army has just turned up, and there's this huge battle. But and yet the Arabs win, and and the, there's a lot of debate about um, at, at that time about what has happened, and the Byzantines decide that what's happened is that they are fighting for their empire, but they're probably not. Most of them are just fighting for their for their wages, for their salary, um, but the Arabs are fighting for God. For their religion and and, and it's and as the the as the byzantines point out it's not an equal fight and so boom suddenly you have this immense empire that you know the, the, the whole way from yes yeah, from china to to the atlantic and so ibn khaldun writes about the rise and fall of these empires i mean there's various stages of the arab empire and then and then the and and the persians and then the the, the rise of the mongols and the mongols are extraordinary as well they come out of this very very small area at the, at the top of the Onon River in in the, on the Mongolian Plateau, which um, there's a, a wonderful English travel writer Colin Thubron who recently wrote a book about uh, going to the um, 
it's somewhere yeah it's somewhere near Karakoram now mm. uh wrote about going going up to the headwaters of the Onon River because it's actually the headwaters of the Amor River which you can see there marked on the on the top right hand side um which is the 10th longest river in the world um and it starts it starts with this this what became the heartland for the for the Mongol empires and yet you know it's it's, it's it's they've come out of nowhere, but that's where Genghis Khan was born. And of course, and the Mongols are are notorious for the kind of violence, and uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's a uh, it's uh, thanks to their movement that the whale kind of dropped on the Islamic world, and you know, a lot of changes. But you make a case for the period of peace, the long period of peace that the Mongols uh, kind of uh, uh, initiated, and. Uh, because of which there is this cultural flowering that you that you yes. talk about. Well, That's I, not I, a normal impression of the Mongols, so you, you must no. <laughs> away from <laughs> that. No, well, I don't think I can be an, I, 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 I don't want to be an apologist for um, the, the yeah. millions of people who died, uh, uh, you know, at the hands of the Mongols. But then uh, that, I don't think they were doing anything that was unusual for the time. I mean, the Chinese had done some terrible things. And, you know, during the Crusades, for instance, I mean, vast populations were were killed um and terrible cruelties i mean it was a thing of the time but um but the mongols used it as this this sort of uber threat um of violence uh, as because they had an imperative and that was sieges were very difficult for for nomads because every nomad fighter had two at least two or three horses and they needed a lot of fodder so if you settle in for a six month siege, I mean, how are you going to feed your feed your horses? So you can't. So what you want is a really quick capitulation. And so the cities that initially that held out were devastated to try and persuade other cities down the line to give up very quickly. And um, and and even the cities that were devastated, Baghdad, for instance, um, several times very quickly you know within within maybe 10 years it's it's again a cultural and political and and cult and commercial center and you think okay so the the accounts that we get are somewhat exaggerated i'm not i don't want to be an apologist as i said for the, for the for the head count because a lot of people did die but um but it, it wasn't the end of life as 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 everyone knew it right. um that that's one point, but the the flower, the cultural flowering, because the what there are several great things about about the Mongols. One is that they absolutely committed to freedom of conscience. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim or a Buddhist or a, a, you worship the Sky Father Tengri or Christian or Nestor, or whatever. That you're you're welcome. That's of no no concern, and they're absolutely committed to open markets and freedom of movement. And the, and they build these amazing sort of roadways um, with with post houses. We know about Roman roads, but the Mongols scaled it up in an extraordinary way. Of course, I, I'm going to fast forward because in the medieval period, you have the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals, all tracing their uh, back uh, backstory to the nomadic uh, tribes that they came from. Yes. Anthony, wonderful to connect with you. Uh, hope to have you on LHI Circle often. And as Thank part you. of discussions, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to, uh, to have you on. You must read the book, The Nomads. It's really, really fascinating. Thank you, Minnie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.